Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have again Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff, we have a interesting little show today. Yes, we do. Yes, uh, some guys that I've actually known for, for quite a long time, and uh, a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, do you hate those guys? And No, we don't, actually. And, and just so <laughs> you have no idea what I'm talking about, we're talking about the MPitch guys. And uh, as a matter of fact, little known fact, one of our one of our guests today was on my PhD dissertation committee. So we actually go way back, and the collaboration between our teams actually goes way back as well. The website for RCE always is rce-cast.com. There's a RSS feed and, the, of course, the iTunes feed there, and you can find old shows. And there's a nomination form if you want to nominate anyone else beyond the show. Also, you can find uh, my Twitter account on there where I will post who's coming up on the show and do a call for questions. If there's anything you ever want to have asked on the show, please include it. Get a little shout-out on the show. Uh, my Twitter name is Brock Palin, B-R-O-C-K-P-A-L-E-N. Yeah, well, actually, let me throw in one minor shout out there to my own blog, which is linked off the RCE cast page as well. It's a MPI and general HPC blog. I, I try to get about one post a week or so, and sometimes they're a little meaty, and sometimes they're things that you know people have asked me about, so I, I try to put it out there so the answers become Googleable and things like that. So if you ever have any questions or comments about uh, MPI and network-related issues, you know, throw them at me, and I'll, I'll put them on the blog. Actually, some of your comments recently about asking what to do with MPIF.h has been a uh, was actually I was thinking about that a bit too. And actually, our guests today probably have some input on that. So why don't you go uh, ahead and introduce them? Yeah, so we have uh, the the original M pitch guys here. So and and I'm I'm probably pronouncing this wrong. So we'll ask this again later. But uh, Rusty Lusk from Argonne National Labs. Rusty, I wonder if you can introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Um, uh, my uh... My real name is uh, Ewing Lusk. That's uh, the, the, what it's written down. But uh, I've always been known as Rusty. I'm uh, currently the uh, division director for the Mathematics and Computer Science Division here at Argonne National Lab. Uh, this is a division that hosts uh, uh, applied mathematics and computer science research, uh, most of which has to do with uh, algorithms and software for uh, very large uh, scale parallel machines. Great, which means that overall you're a really busy guy, and so we appreciate you taking the time for us today. And uh, our other guest is uh, first time ever, somebody, a, a repeat guest who was on uh, just a few shows ago, uh, Dr. Bill Grob from the University of Illinois. Bill, could you uh, give another intro to yourself? Sure. So I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I'm also the Deputy Director of Research for our Institute for Advanced Computing Technologies and Applications, which is a, essentially an uh, organization that tries to connect the National Center for Supercomputing Applications to the rest of campus. And in NCSA, I'm a PI on the Blue Waters Project, which is the NSF-funded project to provide what we believe will be the first sustained petascale machine. Cool. And all that also translates to the fact that you're an incredibly busy guy, and so we also appreciate the fact that you've taken the time out for us twice. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's roll right into this. Um, you guys were the original authors. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody tell me what is the correct pronunciation. It's well, M-P-I-C-H. <laughs> Even <laughs> says that in the book. But, <laughs> but we've given up. Um, <laughs> Even even I have been known to say impitch from time to time. <laughs> I kick him when he does, but <laughs> then he yes, you'll have to me forgive, when I do it. <laughs> you'll have to forgive me because throughout the course of this, I am sure that I will say it the wrong way. Wait, just because it's been, it's it's, it's so ingrained. Uh, I, it's okay. I apologize. We give you permission. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, tell you what. Can you guys uh, give us uh, an overview? What is MPICH and, and what are the project goals? Uh, the uh, the project goals for MPICH were, have been from the beginning to be both a research project and a software project. Uh, the MPICH started during the uh, MPI forum, the first time the MPI forum started meeting in back in uh, 1993. Uh, both Bill and I had uh, portable parallel programming libraries at that time. Uh, Bill's was called uh, Chameleon, mine was called P4. And we started working together, and we started uh, going to the forum meetings. 
the CH in MPICH actually stands for chameleon. And so uh, during uh, an early stage of the forum, we decided we would try to uh, do a test implementation. And as the forum developed its standards and changed its mind from week to week, um, we uh, developed uh, MPICH uh, as a test implementation. Yeah, so yeah, I think one of the interesting things was that um, when the MPI effort was just getting started, I was watching the discussion on one of the news groups discussing the C language, and the GNU guys were tracking all of the uh, various ideas and discovering what worked and what didn't, and I just thought this was great. So when the group that eventually became the MPI forum got together at the uh, pretty infamous Minneapolis supercomputing meeting, uh, we decided that we would commit to doing the same thing, having a rolling implementation uh, that allowed us to check out how implementable or how uh, uh, well-defined the ideas were. And um, that also then allowed us to have an implementation that was ready to go the moment the standard was finished. Of course, this is not how you're supposed to do software. You're supposed to wait until the spec is finished before you start coding. Um, so we were really doing exactly the opposite thing in order to help debug the spec. But I think the, the fact that uh, once the uh, spec was finished, the, then the first implementation was finished, uh, did help get MPI off to a running start in terms of uh, adoption. So M MPICH was the, I almost said MPICH there, MPICH. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> MPICH was the very first implementation of MPI from the first forum. Right. Yeah. There, there were a couple of others that appeared shortly there, shortly after we did MPICH, but uh, MPICH was done, uh, basically it was done before we voted on the standard. Uh, it was definitely first. <laughs> <laughs> so how different is MPI from Chameleon and P4, or are most of the ideas there the same? There are a lot of differences. The, um, uh, uh, at the time, message passing layers had different um, semantics, so they all gave send and receives, but there were different ways in which uh, um, different meanings for some of the tags or when messages were delivered, uh, when you could reuse messages and so forth. Um, and uh, Chameleon in particular tried to provide a sort of general portability layer but papered over some of those details. It was still fairly effective, but it didn't include a lot of the features that are in MPI to support, for example, the use of or the creation of modular software and the use of libraries. Um, I'll let uh, Rusty comment on the P4 um, parts, but one of the, I think the big things is that through the forum's effort, MPI became a, a complete and well thought out collection of routines, and there was no library, even from the vendors uh, at the time, that was as, um, as consistent and as well thought out. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. Uh, P4 was uh, uh, our uh, attempt to try to uh, get some level of portability across the existing system so that every, all the vendors competed with one another at that time on their message passing API as well as on their hardware and their performance. And uh, this was, of course, a hopeless situation for applications. And so P4 was invented as a way to write a portable application that would run on all the various uh, parallel systems of the time, uh, and it, it, uh, I would say, um, it, it didn't have anywhere near the ambition of the MPI form in terms of defining, as Bill said, a, a complete system with uh, carefully thought out uh, semantics, and also uh, a lot of new ideas uh, came in MPI. It, it wasn't just a, uh, a portability layer; it had uh, had new ideas in it. Uh, that, uh, that none of the existing systems had. Uh, Bill mentioned especially uh, the uh, capability to write modular software. That's, that's what the MPI communicators are for. 
So you guys must have been pretty heavily involved with the first MPI forum. You know, Bill was on the MPI forum talk we had earlier, so I assume Bill's still heavily involved. Rusty, are you still involved with the standard? Um, I'm following it from a distance. I'm not going to the current meetings in, of the MPI 3 forum. Um, I'm just a little bit uh, too tied up here. But uh, the uh, people in the, the MPI group that I'm a member of here is still very active, and uh, and they they go to all the meetings. So uh, our Argon team is certainly very much still involved. Okay, and the one thing I have to have answered as a sysadmin is, what is the relationship between MPI CH1 and MPI CH2, and why did they get split up? Well, so this was the fun part. MPI CH2 um, started with Mater. There's yep. essentially <laughs> no shared code between MPI CH1 and MPI CH2. So we got to do the thing that everybody always wants to do, but rarely has the option of doing, which is having written a successful project and then realizing what you wish you had done instead, being able to start over. Um, one of the reasons we were able to do this was that in order to support new functions that were added in MPI 2, we really did have to make a fair number of changes in the way we uh, organized and architected the code. And so rather than try to continue to slather one layer of fix on top of another, we said, okay, we can start over. And so that is uh, really the difference between them. So the, the names are the same. The philosophy behind them is the same. So there is this, the philosophy of providing an infrastructure into which different people can add their own uh, communication backends and support and pieces for uh, the different features. Uh, that was still there, but the architecture of the code and uh, some of the other things changed uh, to support those new features. An example would be that in MPSH2, process management was called out as essentially a first class interface. So there's a generic process management interface that's provided by a separate component, which makes it easier both to support the dynamic process features and to plug into big systems like BlueGene. So what's your words of advice to people who are still using uh, MPI CH1 out there? Throw it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. That didn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, and, what are... And what that's are the of... advice they'll get if they send us a <laughs> bug report um, that says they're using MPI CH1. We, we say, well, we're not really maintaining that anymore. Um, we'd love to help you, but uh, we don't want to help you with MPI CH1. Right. Fair enough. It's free software, so uh, the support you get is free, and, and therefore... <laughs> yeah, I mean, they can still pick up MPSH1 from our website, and um, it's uh, that will always be true, but um, we really encourage them to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you talked about some of the improvements in MPSH2 and the architectural changes and things. How about a concrete question? What kinds of networks does MPSH2 support? So, uh, I'd sort of like to say that that's an ill-formed question. <laughs> um, MPSH2, like MPSH1, but really much more in MPSH2, is really designed to interface to anyone's high-performance interconnect or communication system. And so, one way to, to answer your question would be to say, well, if you get the tarball from us, what's in it? But that really is a misleading answer because other people provide their own um, interfaces and they've either done it by partnering closely with us and including their source code or by taking our code and never talking to us again and adding stuff to it. Um, so depending on what you look at, you'll find almost everything. So uh, everything from simple Ethernet over TCP, we have a partner um, in Canada who has done interface over SCTP. We, of course, have uh, the InfiniBand implementation that's done by uh, DK Pandas Group at Ohio State. Uh, one of the things that you get if you pick up the tarball is the DCMF layer that works on the IBM Blue Gene, and basically everything in between. 
And when you say InfiniBand, I know, of course, you mean open fabrics, right? Yeah, anything you say, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Have to make that distinction because of my employer, you understand. Um, okay, great. Uh, so having been involved in one way or another from, in MPitch from, from the very beginning, how can you, you know, this is this is over a 10-year span now, uh, much more closer to 15, actually. Holy criminy, we've been doing it this long. Uh, how you have you seen the that. project evolve over time, and, and what things have been good, and what things have been bad, and what things have been surprising and unsurprising? Well, Russ, you want to take a crack at that first? Well, um, it seems like there's... Um, uh, there's always plenty to do. Uh, the, it, it's an active, it's an active research project, and if you look at the publications uh, that have come out of it, um, most of them, but not all, uh, uh, at least more than half in the uh, Euro PVM MPI uh, series of meetings, which is where implementation research is uh, usually published. Um, there are a wealth of new topics in implementation research to look at every year. Um, we uh, completely change the way we implement derived data types, for example, in order to improve performance. Uh, over the years, we uh, have tried to run on larger and larger machines. That means uh, changing the data structures for the internal data structures for increased scalability. We've experimented with uh, a number of different process managers, um, and we're, we, we can do that because there is a, the, the code itself has a process management interface that lets us, uh, lets us rely on either our own experimental process managers or our external process managers to start MPI jobs. So um, the, uh, there's always plenty of research to do in the implementation area, and uh, that's uh, that's one of the things that's that's changed. The uh, in fact, the, you know, the code gets a fair amount of change, even though, of course, the interface itself um, is MPI. I think one of the things that was, was um, su surprising and gratifying was something that a game you, that Rusty and I used to play uh, back in the MPI H one days at supercomputing, where we would go around and find a new supercomputer vendor and talk to them about their MPI implementation and basically figure out how long it took for us to discover that it was MPI CH. <laughs> well, I can skip around a little bit, actually. Uh, that was one of the questions. The Cray MPI and a number of other MPIs out there are all, like the environment variables you set for tweaking a library, they're all identical to MPI CH. What are some of the common libraries out there that people are using that are really MPICH based, or which ones are clone a lot of the, if you know how to use MPICH, you can use this one also, but it's completely written from scratch. Well, of course, the idea is that for the application, um, it, it shouldn't make any difference uh, where the MPI library comes from. Um, quite a few of the vendors have adopted MPICH as the um, as the core of their own MPI. Uh, it's uh, architected in such a way that a vendor can, um, there, are, there are internal uh, layers of interface so that a vendor can replace the low-level communication layer, for example, that's customized for his machine and in another place customize it for his, uh, his process startup mechanism. Um, so the, uh, the so I would say most of the uh, the very large machines um, in the world now are using uh, the, the vendor MPI that you get on that machine is a derivative of MPI CH. Uh, some vendors uh, sort of do this at arm's length. That is, they get our code and uh, tweak it to suit them. Other vendors work very closely with us. Um, uh, IBM, uh, the IBM Blue Gene, for example. The, the code for the official IBM stuff sits in our SVN repository. So we, we share code on a you know, daily basis. Uh, we have similar, very close working relationships with uh, Microsoft. Uh, also, we hear from the Cray guys from time to time. Um, so uh, 
at, to varying degrees, uh, lots of the vendor MPIs uh, come from MPICH, uh, and the application writer or an application user shouldn't really even need to know that. So how modifiable is MPICH at runtime? Like what kinds of things can a user tweak without having to rebuild the library to kind of customize the way it does this communication on an individual run basis? Um, well, it sort of depends on what the low, uh, lower communication layer is. So, so for example, for the blue gene, there are a whole bunch of environment variables. Many of those don't apply to your Linux um, or even Windows cluster. Um, similarly, the Intel and Microsoft uh, versions of MKCH have a bunch of environment variables. If you look at sort of the default um, communication system, if you get the tarball and build it, which is our nemesis system, there are uh, a modest number of environment variables um, and parameters that will let you do things like change the eager threshold and some of the um, uh, some of the buffering choices, um, some of the algorithm choices uh, at the collective routine level, um, things like that. But again, MPICH is really designed as this framework to build really fast, really powerful MPI implementations. And a lot of those parameters that you're talking about really depend on the low-level hardware. So it really depends on um, uh, on the exact system that you're, on which you're running and where the communication uh, libraries came from. So I know that's not really the right that's not really the right the answer that you want, but it's the answer that's true. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, going off on a little bit of a tangent there, a name that you threw in there, Nemesis, for the, uh, the, the shared memory communications there. Where did that name come from? Well, it's a, probably the same place names um, all come from. We um, the, the real person to ask would be um, Darius Buntonis, who's really been responsible for putting the code together. Um, but one of the challenges that... Um, uh, that we took on is I, I would hear these statements from people about how an MPI send and receive takes 1,500 somethings, you know, instructions, clock cycles, and nobody was actually really sure what. And that just seemed much, much too large. Um, and so uh, I gave Darius a challenge to try to uh, find a much more realistic number and to document it. And that among other things, led to a new design for a system that supported both shared memory uh, and a collection of networks. And Nemesis is a uh, multi-communication uh, method um, system. And Nemesis was an aggressive word for uh, this is really going to be a uh, kick-ass communication layer. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and I, I should say we're down to a couple hundred instructions. So that 1,500 number was uh, was just way, way too large. Even a couple of hundred is annoying. Okay, well, while we're talking about, uh, you know, issuing challenges and pushing research boundaries and whatnot, what do you guys see as, as the future of MPI CH2? Are there any projects brewing that you can talk about or, or, or features that application developers and or system administrators and whatnot can look forward to? Uh, yeah, well, there are a couple of things uh, in the works. Um, uh, one of them is uh, extreme scalability. Uh, we're, uh, we sort of set ourselves a challenge of what would it take to, to uh, make uh, MPICH run on a, a million processor machine. And um, there are things that uh, have to change in the implementation to do that. Uh, it forces one to think about uh, scalability of data structures uh, much more than we've had to do before. Also, the uh, MPI3 forum is considering uh, a number of very interesting topics, uh, not only in scalability, but in uh, fault tolerance, the new uh, non-blocking collectives, uh, a new way of looking at the uh, one-sided operations. And uh, MP MPICH uh, still, just as it uh, was in the very beginning, uh, in intends to uh, uh, to implement those ideas uh, very 
aggressively, by aggressively I mean uh, before they're finalized even, in order, to, uh, in order to help us understand the implications of things that the forum is considering. So what would you say, kind of going back on the theme of one of my earlier questions, what would you say is the, the biggest strengths of the MPICH project, particularly one, you know, since it is the, the first MPI implementation and has persisted throughout the ages and done very well, you know, what, what would you say are, you know, say the top three strengths, you know, either technology-wise or logistics-wise or political-wise or otherwise? What, what would you say would be the greatest parts? Well, I'd say that, that uh, it is... The usual answer to such questions is it's the people, um, and that really is true here. So, uh, Rusty and I had um, a great time working on it initially. Um, as it became successful, we um, we attracted some really great people to work on it. Uh, an early example was uh, Rajiv Thakur, who did the I/O implementation, the Romeo implementation, which, if anything, is probably used by even more people than MPICH in terms of being part of their MPI implementations. Um, and that it just continued to grow. So it, it's, a, it's a great group um, the, uh, evaluated by the metrics both of, of the success of the project but also the, the papers, um, uh, a surprising number of which, maybe not a surprising number of which, have been given awards at conferences. Uh, that really is, I think, our single biggest strength um, past that, I think the, the focus on a framework that allows people to take advantage of whatever weird hardware they have or whatever weird situation they're in has been a, 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 a tremendous advantage, and it's one that continues to bring people um, to our door or to Starfar software and take it uh, as the basis of whatever system they're putting together. So that's two. Rusty, your turn. Um, I, I think I, I would echo, echo that. The, the focus uh, on it as a, as a research project as well as uh, useful software um, makes, means that it's, uh, it's uh, always fresh and has new ideas in every release um, and keeps uh, lots of good people uh, interested in it. You want to skip down to the uh, strangest use? We have a good answer for that one. Oh, you have a good answer for that one? All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since we had already talked about the uh, the other MPIs that are based off of MPICH, I was kind of curious about the, your relationship. I mean, Jeff's always said that you guys are friendly and like that, but I'm curious about that. So let me pose that question for real. Okay. Um, so the... The MPI movement to to have a standard is really, uh, from the beginning, has been more important than uh, the the implementations themselves. Uh, so all of us who are MPI enthusiasts uh, are, are happy about the fact that there are lots of uh, MPI implementations. Uh, Open MPI is uh, sort of the the other. Uh, major open source implementation, and uh, we uh, have a good relationship with the Open MPI guys, and uh, uh, we um, the, there's a friendly competition so that if we implement something that's uh, you know faster than our own previous version, uh, we certainly have to uh, go test and, and and make sure that it beats Open MPI before uh, we publish the results, and I'm sure they do the exact same thing. Um, we also share some code. Uh, unless I'm wrong, Jeff, uh, Romeo is still in uh, used in OpenMPI. Uh, yes, we use uh, we use your stuff for the processor affinity. Uh, so we you know we share each other's code. We share the tests. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a that's a nice relationship to have, and we're 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 all uh, MPI guys. Yeah, let me let me throw a little more on the end there. I, I got to completely agree with Rusty that uh, you know over the years, you know when I was a, a young ambitious grad student, I thought that you know MPICH was the enemy and they must must be defeated at all costs. You know, and uh, as I've gotten older and hopefully a little bit wiser, I, I've come to appreciate the value actually that not only is the competition good for us because yes, you know we we do strive to make sure that we are at, at a minimum competitive with all the other MPI implementations out there to include MPICH. But 
also just the exchange of ideas. You know, you, you talk to all the other implementers and, and whatnot that you see at the MPI forum. You say, hey, how are you guys doing this? And just the free flow exchange of ideas from someone who has a, a different viewpoint than yours is just incredibly valuable. Um, and, and that has resulted in a, in a collective boon, I think, of all of our MPI implementations. So the fact that there isn't just one MPI implementation that rules the world is, is a very, very good thing. And it also keeps us honest because, you know, the users will come to us, and I, I, I admit I lurk on the MPI CH list, so I see these too. But the same exact thing happens to us that users come and say, hey, you know, my program works great with MPI CH, but it, it fails in, in this other MPI implementation, why? You know, and, and then it's, you have to figure out why. Is it a problem with their code? Is it a problem with a specific MPI implementation and so on? And, and at least half the time I'd say, you know, it is a problem with an implementation that needs to be figured out. But the fact that the user has something else to compare to, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. It helps us all. Right, I agree. Yeah, it sounds like you're avoiding the group think problem a lot. Well, let me use that to segue into the next question then. So you used a, a keyword that we, we love to ask uh, just about every project who comes on here. What's, what's the weirdest or strangest use of your software that was probably particularly unexpected? Somebody using your stuff in, in ways that you hadn't anticipated. Well, um, certainly one that, came, that comes to mind is uh, uh, MPI in space. Um, during uh, one, one of the participants in the MPI uh, one form was from uh, uh, Hughes, Hughes Aircraft, wasn't that right? Yeah, yeah, Hughes Aircraft. And uh, they were doing a satellite. They were making a satellite, and um, they were uh, they decided to, it had multiple processors in it uh, uh, of different kinds, and so they needed to write a parallel program, and. Um, uh, his name was Levin. What was his first Lewins, name? Lloyd Lewins. Lloyd, yeah, Lloyd Lewins uh, was a participant in the forum, and he was responsible for the software. So uh, he developed an ADA binding for the MPI uh, functions. Uh, that was never part of the uh, the forum's charge. And um, and there's a satellite running around in space somewhere that has an MPI program in it. And, and it was a it was a useful reminder that uh, the MPI standard doesn't assume that you have Unix, it doesn't assume that, uh, that it even has uh, standard in and standard out. And so uh, it was sort of a, a, a reminder to keep the project uh, abstract and not tie it to other things. But uh, yeah, I, I consider that sort of weird. Yeah, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> well, it's like different. I mean, we've always been working to just like get as much horsepower. Sounds like there they more had specialized units. It wasn't necessarily get the most performance out of it. They were just communicating between discrete units. Uh, right, right. Uh, that is, that's cool. That's really cool. I like that. We told you we had a great answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> yes, you did, but you're not supposed to admit that in front of the, the uh, audience. <laughs> no, that's what editing is for. <laughs> that's true. All right, so while we're in the superlatives category here, uh, what's, the, what's the most difficult bug you've ever had to track down? Maybe in a, either in a large-scale application or in an MPI implementation. Uh, you know, what, what's the worst one? Do you have anything that sticks out in your head? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this... Um, this is actually one that Rajiv uh, found. So there was a user who was running a multi-threaded program, and it was a iterative program. It really looked very good. Um, it was very hard to see what was going wrong. Eventually, it turned out that the user was using the same tags in each iteration. So a lot of People will uh, put the iteration counter for the tag number, but in this case, you know, just use three. And the communication pattern was such that, in some cases, the send from iteration k plus one would match a receive in iteration k. That was pretty awful. <laughs> Took a while to find because just not the way 
when you're looking at the code, you don't sort of unroll the loop and then look for where things could cross. And it, this is particularly interesting because when Rajiv showed this example to some colleagues who were using uh, techniques from formal verification to try to uh, understand API programs, they were able to uh, improve their system so that it would actually catch things like this if you uh, presented their tool with a code like this. They'd be able to tell you this code does not act the way you think it's going to act. Um, that was really pretty gnarly. You really had to look at it in ways that are unusual. I can talk about a bug that was my own bug. Uh, I don't know, this is pretty arcane for uh, general, the general public, but Jeff will appreciate it. Um, I was using the MPI one-sided, and uh, I had to send, I was doing a neuroscience modeling, and uh, from time to time, a, uh, uh, a neuron running on a process would do a put of a certain value to another process, uh, simulating a... Uh, uh, what's called a, a spike from a neuron, which has evolved over time to the point where it uh, pokes the neurons it's connected to. And so uh, I had a uh, I had a subroutine to do this to, to send the spikes, and I called the subroutine, and um, and in the subroutine I did a put, and uh, after returning from the subroutine, uh, I would do the uh, uh, the various processes would do the fence. Uh, to complete the, the one-sided synchronization. So now if Jeff's really awake, he already knows what the bug was. Uh, the uh, the uh, value of the spike was just an integer. So in this subroutine, I declared um, you know, int spike val equals one. Um, but of course, I put it on the stack. Uh, that is, the compiler put it in the stack. So after I returned and did the fence, the value was, was no good anymore. And so uh, random values got sent to the spike instead of the one. That was, well, that was that, I, didn't, I didn't spot that right away. Yeah, that, those are the worst. <laughs> Gotta hate the random memory. You're like, the code is right. What is wrong? <laughs> it's like when I used to teach introduction to computer science and the students would come to me, and uh, uh, they wouldn't say, the, uh, can you help me find the bug in my program? They would say, the computer isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> my, my program compiles, so therefore it must be correct. Yes. On that note of talking about you know, new programmers introduction, what is something that every person starting out, the grad student who's starting using MPI, the, you know, experimentalist turn, you know, computationalist at a national lab, when they're targeting with MPI, what should they keep in mind? I think that the, the first thing they should keep in mind is to see whether they can succeed without using MPI. After all, one of the things that we tried to do with MPI was encourage the development of libraries. So, all too often we see people who are reinventing uh, Petsy Lite instead of just pulling up the library and using it. Uh, so really that is, I think, the first thing. The MPI enabled a entire parallel ecosystem for scientific software. And first thing you should do is see if you've already had someone else do the job for you. I think after that, if you actually have to write the code, then you have to confront the top-down versus bottom-up. And the next mistake that people make is they write the individual node code and then try to figure out how to glue it together to all of the other nodes. And we really feel that for many applications, what you want to do is start by, by viewing your, your application as a global application. You have global data structures. Figure out how you decompose it and then the code to, uh, to coordinate the communication between them will be pretty obvious. And you can tell the difference between how an application was built from whether it was top-down or bottom-up. 
So would you still recommend people to always have a serial version of their code, or if they know they're going to need some sort of parallel, they should start thinking about that in their algorithm right away? Well, I, I sort of I would say both, is that you want to have a, a version of the code that, in, that contains the algorithms and the thinking um, at that level. But when you decide to make it parallel, when you decide to how you're going to, to cut it up, you want to think about how you decompose your data structures, you know, how you, you think of them globally, um, rather than saying, okay, I need to think of everything parallel, so I'll have all these little patches, and these little patches I'll compute on them, and then I'll figure out how to stitch them together. Um, it's, if, you were, um, if you were building a house, you'd start with a set of blueprints that gave you a picture of what the whole house looked like. You wouldn't start with a bunch of tiles and say, well, I'll put this tile down on the ground, and I'll find a tile to go next to it. <laughs> But all too many people um, try to build their parallel programs by creating the smallest possible tiles and then trying to um, have it sort of em have the structure of their code emerge from this chaos of all these little pieces. You have to have an organizing principle if you're going to survive making your code parallel. So one last question before I hand off to Jeff. What do you see coming into future either beyond MPI? Uh, I just spoke earlier with Bill Kramer um, about Blue Waters, and they're pushing, you know, unified parallel C, Coray, Fortran, and MPI. Do you see a little bit of change in the ecosystem here in the future, or some more hybrid form of programming in the future? Well, I think when we go to very, very large uh, processor counts. Um, We'll be. We'll have to look at something a little bit different. Um, it's not clear what that will be yet. What's happening is that the uh, the numbers of processors uh, are not going up in the in same proportion as the amount of memory per node, and so uh, maybe not all applications, but a large number of applications will start to get squeezed uh, so that a full uh, MPI process uh, will take up an, in, an increasingly uh, increasing percentage of the amount of memory that's used. So uh, we as MPI implementers are going to try to uh, postpone that time, but as the machines get bigger but the memories don't, um, uh, I can see a lot of applications moving to a sort of a, a hybrid approach. Uh, and even some applications now are starting to uh, use on, on, um, on machines that have multiple processors um, per address space, using MPI to move data between address spaces, which is, I, I think, a good way to think of what MPI is targeted at. Um, but perhaps use some other form of parallelism uh, within an address space, the one that's most uh, commonly available and used is uh, OpenMP, and one reason that works is because uh, OpenMP and MPI uh, have sort of a semantic handshake that's, that says in their respective standards how they work together. Uh, so one can also envision using something like UPC with uh, as the single address space version, or stitching a number of nodes that don't physically share memory uh, into one address space using UPC, and uh, and still having MPI as the uh, mechanism for moving data between address spaces, uh, and and we've done uh, our group has done some uh, some research in that, and and it looks promising. I myself believe that uh, that we're probably going to be using MPI for a, a long time for this for the role of moving data among address spaces. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And in, in fact, on Blue Waters, the, uh, what we're really trying to do is make it possible for people to use modules written in some other language with what we know will be their primary uh, code environment and their MPI code. So uh, we fully expect that the code will really be an MPI code, but maybe the 3D FFT module will be written in UPC, or the Halo Exchange will be written in Coray Fortran. 
Okay, those are great answers and actually uh, great, great looks to the future there. Let me ask you a question that's going to seem to come out of left field here, but we're almost out of time, and this is something I love to ask every other software project. Um, what uh, software repository system do you use and why? Well, we're using SVN, and we're using it. We've been through all of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say we've been through all of them, but we've, <laughs> we've certainly been through a lot of them. Um, we moved to SVN from CVS. Um, there, as anyone who's looked at both of them knows, there's some things you can't do in CVS that you um, that are easier to do in SVN, uh, particularly moving things from place to place, which makes it a little easier to uh, to play with some of the um, uh, organizations. It also has made it easier for us um, to uh, work with some of our external collaborators. Is SVN's um, remote access is more palatable and uh, uh, more acceptable than the one in CBS. Um, and of course, it's open source, so um, all of our, you know, we can use it, all of our partners can use it. Okay, well, guys, thank you very much for taking your time out today to speak about this. Bill, thanks again for coming uh, on the show twice, and who knows, I mean, you may be on here again. <laughs> That's right. You may have many other distinctions and awards, but you're the only guy in the world who's been on this podcast twice. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, can I get like a website and stuff for MPitch and where it can be downloaded? MPICH, geez. That's okay. Real easy. Well, the, the, the real answer, of course, is just Google it, it'll pop up at the top, but it's www.mcs.anl.gov slash mpich. Hey, great. Well, thanks, guys, for your time today. We appreciate okay. it. My Talk pleasure. Right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.